All right, thank you, Marcy. I guess you're seeing my screen now, and I'm glad you're you're with us for the next two hours. I hope this two hours will be helpful to you. These are copyrighted materials, and we are an AIA education provider. Many of you are here for that reason, and this is the slide they've given us to give you a little bit of information about that. You've already read this uh, description. Most likely you're on the webinar now, so um, I will go ahead to the next slide and show you the cover of the document on which this presentation is based. And it looks like this. It's the 2015 Code Conforming Wood Design document published uh, jointly by the American Wood Council and the International Code Council. And I know that Brian has a link in the handouts part of your webinar dashboard for you to download this. Perhaps you've downloaded this, printed it out. If you have, it may be handy to you as we go through the webinar today. It's become a popular document. It attempts to summarize the fundamentals for wood construction in the International Building Code. This is a document and this is a webinar about the International Building Code. It's not about the International Residential Code or single family construction, but about how wood can be used for commercial buildings or buildings that are typically considered commercial and under the International Building Code. Major topics are allowable building size, special occupancies. We will spend quite a bit of time on fire resistance. It's an important issue when it comes to wood construction. Building features is a catch-all in this document. Wood and non-combustible construction types, we'll summarize that. New to this document are structural considerations. And what this primarily uh, concerns are exact descriptions of what is covered by the IBC and then also descriptions about what our standards cover, the American Wood Council standards that is, that are referenced by the building code uh, to give you a framework for how they can be used together. And then finally precautions during construction. Our objectives today, five primary objections and a few that are uh, not objections, I'm sorry, objectives, and a few that are not stated here. But uh, when using the International Building Code, the first question to ask is, can you even build it out of wood? So building size limits. Also uh, fire resistance, as I said, precautions during construction, critical topic. Then a catch-all section of various features for wood in the IBC, finishes, trim, appendages, balconies, and so forth, other, other uh, topics. And then finally, we're going to give you a framework, as I said, for the structural provisions for wood in the IBC. The American Wood Council you may know it by a previous name, the American Forest and Paper Association. There is still an American Forest and Paper Association. We are a separate entity now. We always have been the same group, though, the membership organization that does primarily three things. Uh, first of all, we develop state-of-the-art design standards that are referenced in the building code for the design community through our ANSI committees. Also, we assist in code development, and that's where our work touches on the model building codes that are used, mostly the International Building Code, but other ones as well, such as NFPA. And then finally, we provide information related to those two uh, through our technology transfer department. These are covers of our 2015 Wood Frame Construction Manual and National Design Specification. You, most of you are very familiar with these, um, and you can find all kinds of information at our website. So 
So we're glad to put on this webinar. I'm glad to be able to present today. The International Code Council, the other author of this uh, summary that we're talking about today, is a very excellent organization, of course. Uh, their own governmental consensus process for developing codes is uh, the primary one, of course, in our country. Uh, it's a model, I believe, for um, private association participation and good public policy. And uh, I think we're fortunate to have such an organization and such a system of codes. I'm gonna, we're going to test a audience interaction uh, feature here and give you a polling question. I'd like to know who's listening today. If you could, I'm going to turn it over to Marcy. She's going to ask you this question and you'll be able to respond. Marcy? Great. All right. You may go ahead right now and, and vote. Um, just what is your profession? Are you an architect, engineer, code official, building designer, or other? Um, we've got a lot of material to cover today, folks, so that we're going to not take a whole lot of time on these polls. So if you could quickly vote, um, I'm not going to give you much time. So um, I've got 81% that have already voted, so I'm going to go ahead and close and share. Um, we've got 68% engineers, 20% code officials, 6 protect, excuse me, 6% architects, 5% other, and 1% building designers. All right, Paul? I'm going to repeat those, uh, Marcy. If you, so 68% engineers, 20% code officials, 6% architects. 5% other, and 1% building designers. All right, great. Okay. Thank you. And thanks for responding to the poll. Very good. Wood has, of course, very distinct advantages. It's a renewable resource. Forests now are sustainably managed. Um, life cycle assessment shows wood to be good. And there's many issues, of course, why uh, we want to use wood. And uh, more wood is constructed of or more buildings, rather, are constructed of wood than any other material. And wood can be thought of as not only the building choice building material of the past, but also of the future. We'll talk about that a little bit as we go. I'm going to go very quickly through these next slides on use and occupancy classification, because this is a fundamental decision that is made by the designer along with the code official who has the last say on this. Uh, and the basic principles are um, what's the building, the design purpose of the building, its occupancy, and you match it up to these descriptions. And in this uh, CCWD, and that's how I'll refer to the document, the publication we're speaking about, the 2015 Code Conforming Wood Design. We cover eight of these in our building sizing tables and other sections of that document. You can use wood, of course, for use group U and use group H even, but those are beyond the scope of this document. Whatever the building's used for, you look at the descriptions, 302.1, and here they are, group A1, performing arts, a2, anything with food and drink. A3, a catch-all for assembly occupancies. Group 4, sports, indoor arenas, skating rinks, swimming pools, and so forth. Group 5, outdoor sporting facilities, grandstands, stadiums, and so forth. Group B, business, is a catch-all for many occupancies that may not fit into something else. But its core description is office, professional, and service type transactions. E, educational, schools primarily, also daycare for children other than infants. Group F, factory, Split into two use groups, F1, F2, moderate hazard, low hazard, low hazard, 
implies and assumes non-combustible materials are being manufactured. There's, in each of these use groups, there's lists of these in Chapter 3 uh, to look at for examples. I stands for institutional. I2, perhaps well, most well-known hospitals, child care, including infants. Jails also, I3. Uh, I4, daycare, special uh, designation use group that has been developed in recent years. And also I1, residential and custodial care. I1 and I3 are further broken into certain conditions based on the capabilities of the people in those occupancies. Group M is mercantile. Here's some examples here. R1, hotels, motels, boarding houses. It's a beautiful photograph of a, quite a house. R2, apartments, dormitories, live work units, timeshare, and so forth, non-transient residential uses. R3 are single family and two family dwellings, typically outside the scope of the IBC. So where would R3 come into play in the IBC? Well, if you have a mixed use building, you might have an R3 apartment above a mercantile or a single family dwelling attached to a church or something. That's where R3 would come into play, typically in the IBC. R4, relatively new occupancy classification, residential care, and assisted living. There's two conditions. Now in the 2015 code, occupants are capable of responding or they're not, or they need assistance. So there's subcategories for R4. S, storage, similar to F1 and F2, and uh, the pattern is similar. You have moderate hazard and low hazard involving storage of non-combustible materials. However, it can be in combustible packaging. There's examples in 311. I know I went through that quickly, but that's so fundamental to most of you. Once that decision is made, uh, you never return to it typically until you change the use of the building and then you have to go back to that again. Always consult your code official if there's any question from the very start about the use of the building. If you're, uh, of course, as a consulting engineer or as an architect, uh, you could save yourself a world of trouble by uh, coordinating with the code official at the very start on that, naming your use groups. We do have a system of referenced standards and in the international code system. And of course, reference standards do take the force of law, just like the building code does, to the prescribed extent of the reference. And that's the way the international building code um, uses standards. They're all listed in the back of the code, of course. They're developed in a consensus process, either ANSI or ASTM. The American Wood Council uh, has standards referenced in the International Building Code, of course. First one listed here is the Fundamental Wood Structural Design Standard, the National Design Specification for Wood Construction. The second one is, um, we affectionately call it the SPIDWIS, though it doesn't exactly fit the acronym, but it's a special design provisions for wind and seismic. That contains the fundamental provisions for lateral load resisting systems, framing, sheathing, connections for diaphragm, shear walls, and also combined shear and uplift from wind. Wood frame construction manual, the third one, that's a engineered yet prescriptive document for one and two family dwellings. But we'll see as we go along, it also has some application for small commercial buildings. And then finally, the span tables for joists and rafters, as we've always published.
Chapter 6, of course, in the International Building Code defines the types of construction that we're dealing with. We're going to talk the wood frame construction types. Those are 5, 4, and 3. You still retain the Roman numeral designations for those. I wish they'd switch to the other myself, but there they are. And we'll talk about those uh, as we go throughout, but the, there are specific applications also for wood in types 1 and 2. Type 5, we're all familiar with type 5 construction. It's usually wood frame. It can be any approved material. These buildings have the smallest footprint, smallest size. These have the least fire resistance ratings. And so type 5 construction is at the right end of table uh, 601. We'll look at that table in a moment. Type 4 construction. Type 4 construction is getting a lot of attention these days. It is heavy timber. You can refer to Type 4 as heavy timber construction. One of the distinguishing features of Type 4 heavy timber is that the exterior walls must be of non-combustible materials or fire retardant treated wood traditionally. And under the 2015 code, now they can be something else, and that is cross-laminated timber. And I'll talk specifically about cross-laminated timber in a moment. It is protected cross-laminated timber in the exterior walls, meaning it is covered uh, from the exterior. But in type 4, being heavy timber, it's a unique construction type. The, besides the exterior walls, the interior must be minimum sizes of solid or structural composite lumber or solid lumber or laminated wood. And the other distinguishing feature about Type 4 is it cannot have concealed spaces in the building. This is quite a challenge. Uh, in the current code cycle, we're working on a means of having protected concealed spaces in Type 4 buildings based on similar provisions to what are in NFPA 13, the sprinkler standard for protecting concealed spaces of combustible construction. Here are the minimum dimensions for columns and beams and girders in type 4. Probably familiar with those. Flooring also has minimum dimensions in type 4, roof decking and partitions. Here is the product that is causing a um, much conversation in regard to Type 4. <clears throat> because all of a sudden, cross-laminated timber is layers of dimension lumber or structural composite lumber laminated together in crosswise fashion. You see a picture of it here. To make a solid wood floor or roof or wall section as you see it here. Um, as you can tell, it has high structural capacity, a great leap in structural capacity compared to light frame construction. It also has high fire resistance given that it's solid wood. There's no concealed spaces between repetitive members in the walls or in the floors. So the combination of high structural capacity and high fire resistance make it a candidate for all kinds of buildings that before now it didn't make a lot of sense to have them in, out of wood, but now it does. So there's many notable buildings now around the world already built of cross-laminated timber, taller wood structures. We ourselves at AWC put forward a code change in this current code cycle regarding a special occupancy of nine stories. It um, did not receive the two-thirds vote required at the public comment hearing to receive a recommendation from that hearing. It did receive a majority vote. It is still under consideration in the CDP access process. Lots of support, very positive approach to this. You can read about it. More importantly, the International Code Council has sent out a request for comments. The Board of Directors wants to have a tall wood ad hoc committee, and they've sent out a request for comments. You can read that on the ICC website. 
And there, the whole focus of this effort, of course, is to decide what would be appropriate criteria for what essentially, in my opinion, needs to be a new construction type for this uh, new building system. So that's going forward, and it's rather exciting. It does give wood opportunities and sustainable building, increased opportunities, and so forth, and all the other advantages that come with wood construction. Where do we stand now in the code? Well, in the 2015 code, it's type 4 buildings only. Now, it can be used in type 5 buildings. It's just not specifically described there, but since type 5 can be any approved material uh, based on it being manufactured in accordance with the code reference standard that you see here, ANSI APA 190.1, you can certainly use it in type 5. Type 4, you can use it with uh, specific provisions regarding exterior walls. Um, there are test reports available for fire resistance testing, and they are also ongoing. If you have questions about type 4 construction, we're, of course, anytime we're more than happy to answer those. I'll move on to type 3. Type 3 also has the restriction of non-combustible exterior walls or fire retardant treated walls. In the 2015 code, CLT is not specifically uh, designated in Type 3 construction. 3A and 3B, of course, designate one hour and uh, no specific rating in 3B. 1 and 2 construction, building materials for the most part, certainly the structural load bearing frame and of the building is um, non-combustible. Let's look at heights and areas, and I'll go through Chapter 5 here, how the International Building Code handles the size of a building. And you will find that the code conforming wood design will be a handy document in this regard. As we said, the first objective today is to decide even if you can build a building out of wood. And that's going to be the decision that you as engineers or design uh, professionals are going to advise on. You have to consult the code. You might think that it's a, uh, um, well, design or a choice of materials are made on many other decisions other than what can, can be done in terms of size. I understand that. But of course, you have to answer that fundamental question first. What's happened in the 2015 code is that the system for determining allowable size has changed. Only the format, only the system. The building sizes and the building heights have not changed. So no change, but a change to the system. I can hear the groans, uh, perhaps, many of you. This, does, uh, this topic gets some groans, but this was put forward by the Building Code Action Committee, from the International Code Council, and the whole focus and goal of this new system was to eliminate the possibility of making a mistake when calculating building size. So what it has done is it has taken some of the formulas and made them into tables that can be entered. You find the number, less room for error in terms of uh, calculations that might be applied inappropriately or inaccurately. And I think it will, this system will work to reduce errors, even though on the surface as anything new, it seems more complicated. Um, in the end, I don't believe it will be, but we'll find out only as we use the 2015. This is not a table in the code book itself. Over here on the left, you have, uh, we've truncated portions of two tables in this diagram. And I'm just drawing this to your attention. So you won't find this a table in the building code itself. It's a truncated separate table that we have in code conforming wood design. There's two tables in the building code now that deal with allowable building height, 504.3 and 504.4. So we've taken some representative use groups here and 
offered on the right there, the combustible construction types only or the ones that can be wood and the appropriate values. The third table in the 2015 code is a large table with lots of base floor areas and these floor areas in this table are called the tabular building area factor. We'll see the formulas in a minute, but the point is table 506.2. Um, it's a large table filled with these numbers. We have just a small portion of it here in the CCWD. Here's the new basic equation in the 2015 IBC. You'll see the, the variables are um, a little different. Right off the bat, you look at the left there, A sub A. This is the allowable building area. No longer will you be aiming for only allowable floor area per floor. Uh, you can know that, and in fact, you have to figure that. Um, you will get that by this formula you're looking at on the screen. But when we come to multi-story buildings, you're going to be calculating the total building area immediately uh, straight from the equation. So this is that multi-story building area equation. A particular interest here is the variable NS, which stands for non-sprinklered. I'll back up one slide, and you'll see it also in the first equation, NS, non-sprinklered. Going back to our multi-story building equation now, why is that stuck in there? Well, you'll see, or you will have seen in table 506.2, and I'll back up to that now, that you have uh, NS, S1, SM, as in multiple, um, multi, uh, multiple story. Uh, I'm actually uh, experimenting here with, a, okay, this will make it easier for us. What I'm looking at is right here. This is table 602, and we have uh, NS non-sprinklered, S1 stands for one-story sprinkler building, SM stands for multi-story sprinkler, and that's what we have. You're going to be looking at this factor for these formulas that we're looking at here. And this is the one for multi-story buildings, and you'll end up with an, a whole building area here. Equation 5.2, this is a factor you pull from that table. And the number of stories is taken into account with this factor. All right. The area increase for frontage, if you have open perimeter around a building, of course, you get a little break on the area restriction. This has not changed at all. Same equation as you had before in 506.3. The F here is the entire frontage, or the frontage with open perimeter, and the P is the entire perimeter. The W we'll talk about in a minute. Also, the weighted a average for calculating the W, that has not changed in the 2015. So if you're used to that, you're used to it. And just as by way of a quick example here, you match up your W distance of open frontage with the length of the wall that corresponds to it. You put them in that formula, and in this case, in this example, which you can go over in detail on your own, we ended up with a W value of 28 feet. There's only a small variation of how much this affects really the size of the building. Here's another example, frontage increase. What if we had a two-story restaurant, type 3A construction, and the street width here is 22 feet? If we want to determine the area limitation, we find the length of the walls corresponding to the width of the open space. Note that when the width of the open space exceeds 30, you do end up using 30, according to the code. And here again at this example, we ended up with a W of 28 feet. 
here's the solution. This a sub t, you basically have to just go find this first. That's all this is indicating. Go find this in table 506.2 for this building, restaurant, non-sprinkler, and so forth. Uh, 14,000, that's going to turn into a factor. This is the same as it's always been. We plug it into equation 5-2 down here. Um, and we have a two-story building. That's this factor. We ended up with a total building area, 42,280. It's less, less than... Well, it shows it less than... You know, I can go over these slides a hundred times and still find something. But if it is less than, oh no, I'm sorry, I, I second-guessed myself. The actual area is greater here, so this one doesn't work. And you might have said, a lot of you code officials especially, if you're watching, you might have said, hey, wait a second, uh, you got a restaurant and you have people sitting in the restaurant at the second story above the level of exit discharge, you have to have sprinklers. We assumed no sprinklers when we started. So this is a great example of checking your Chapter 9 sprinkler thresholds to see if you can actually do a sprinkler or unsprinkler building. In this case, unless you had direct exiting to, the, to a level of exit discharge above, you couldn't. So if we do put in the sprinklers, we end up being okay in that case. This was assuming non-sprinklered, and we end up being okay. You get, uh, when you do have an NFP 13 compliant sprinkler system, of course you get uh, area increases for your building. What it works out to, and by the way, this is all built into these formulas now, but you, multi you triple the area of your single story building with a full 13 system sprinkler and you double the story of a two-story building, or you double the area, rather, of a two-story building. Here's a quick example. Uh, 5B school, NFPA 13 system. Find the maximum allowable building area. First, we go to 506.2 and find our NS factor. We're going to need to plug that in. We go to the frontage increase, the same formula we're used to. We find that W is 30 in this case. We find our tabular allowable area factor from table 602. A sub T is 38,000 square feet. We plug it into our equation. In this case, a single story building. This is 5.1. And we come up with this. Our actual area is less, so we're OK. Please feel free to go over these on, at your own leisure. Um, when you take a look, have a chance to look at this program on our website. As I mentioned, don't get caught by forgetting about the sprinkler thresholds in Chapter 9. When you do all this allowable building size stuff, uh, you don't forget that you have many occupancies that will calculate out in Chapter 5, but if you go to Chapter 9, you'll find because they're fire area exceeds 12,000 square feet or 24,000 square feet or whatever, you have to have sprinklers. So these thresholds apply to all construction types. So just remember uh, that perhaps someday the code will flag you more appropriately for these sprinkler thr thresholds. For now, I think they're serving a good purpose where they are in Chapter 9. You get lots of trade-offs, or some might call them trade-ups, in the code for sprinkler systems. It is a superior form of life safety and property safety protection. It does uh, drastically increase the safety of buildings when they're installed, and therefore the code acknowledges this and also gives incentives for their installation. Of course, in Group R, as you know, you always have to have sprinkler systems. There's no, really no exceptions. Um, but here are a few of the trade-ups or trade-offs you get. Flexibility in means and egress, reduction in dwelling unit separations, some reductions in other ratings, corridor protection, and so forth. Uh, you're probably familiar with these, but I always remind uh, engineers and architects to try to summarize these on any project and see if you can get sprinklers in the building and make it 
for every building, get it cost effective because it really is a great thing. We have another poll question. So, Marcy, you want to try this one? Yes, indeed. So, right. just one second. Alrighty, sorry about that. When a building has an approved automatic sprinkler system per 903.3, or excuse me, 903.3.1.1, the maximum number of stories may be increased by two. Is that true or false? I'm so glad people just go ahead and start vote, voting. That's awesome. Again, we're not going to take too long, but I would like to see about 80% of you vote. And I've got about 70%, so hurry and vote, folks. Well, we have them stumped. We've got about 50%, I mean, 50 half and half here. So, all right, 76%. Four more. Come on. <laughs> all right, I'm going to go ahead and close here and share. So we've got 53% say true, 47% say false, half and half. Boy, you stumped them, Paul. What is the real All right. answer? All right. Well, the real answer is false. It's not a trick question, but we didn't list the NFPA 13 system along with that 903.3.1.1. That section actually references the NF full NFPA 13 system you do only get a one-story increase uh, typically uh, for sprinklers, so not two stories. All right. Very good. Let's go on. The total building area limit is built into these new equations. Uh, and how it works out is the same as the old code. If you're used to the 2012 IBC, you get the same story limit. It's built right into the equations. This little example I'm going to give next uh, gives you an example of what happens. Basically, you have a single story maximum area. Um, if you have a two story building, you get twice that. If you have a three story building, you get three times that. And then finally, after that, you don't get any more building area. So you have to, if you go up higher, you got to begin reducing the area of the individual stories to meet your total three-story limit. This used to be in the text of the 2012, very clearly stated. Now it's kind of hidden in those formulas. So it works out this way if you do it. Use the formulas. You also have, of course, uh, mixed occupancy buildings. That's a little bit beyond the scope of this. Um, it's a very important topic because probably there are more mixed occupancy buildings than there are single occupancy. But same principles apply. You have to address the mixed occupancies in one of three ways, or one of two ways, two primary ways. We'll talk about those in a minute. But a very important point, you can have a basement that does not uh, need to be included in the total allowable, allowable building area. That has not changed. So if you have a single story, single story below grade, uh, you add, you can add that on free and clear to the building area. There are, of course, special provisions for basements if they have no windows and so forth. There may be some exiting considerations and even some sprinkling considerations to be aware of in stories below grade. But when it comes to building area, you can have a basement added on free and clear in terms of area. What are those ways of dealing with mixed occupancies? Well, you have non-separated occupancies. That's easy to understand in section 503, 8.3 rather. Um, you just consider the whole building the more restrictive occupancy in regard to area limits in chapter five and you determine your construction type that way no fire resistance rating between the different occupancies, or you can provide fire resistance 
between the occupancies in accordance with table and section 508.4. And then you have to do some comparisons of actual area of the building to the allowable area of the use for each use group and each portion of the building that has a different use. And you add those ratios together uh, to see if you're within the allowable area for each. In the new code 2015, I think the numbering is a little different, but it's shown here correctly, 506 2.2 through 2.4 for single and multi-story mixed occupancy buildings because when you go up a course with more stories and mixed occupancy building, then you also have to apply those comparisons of ratios um, to the story levels in the whole building. Now, we've spent a uh, good, incredibly, 40 minutes uh, on this building size thing. There's an easier way, at least to get an estimate of building size. You can use code-conforming wood design and the tables in the back. Here's an example of one. For those of you who have printed out your code-conforming wood design, if you flip through the back or if you got it on a PDF on your computer maybe, you'll find this one on page 37. It's just an example. You've got the uh, number of stories over here. If you want to estimate your percent open frontage here, you've got your wood construction types across the top. And this does give maximum floor area per story all right, in the CCWD. And by the way, if you're used to using the 2012, these have not changed. Because the result has not changed in regard to the building code. So uh, we have some footnotes also in these tables that may be helpful. Um, for instance, under Group E, we flag you in the footnote about the sprinkler thresholds in Chapter 9. So we're trying to make them very helpful. For instance, if you are thinking in the project uh, or the design conception stage of a project and you want a Group E uh, school building, you got a footprint like this, maximum allowable area. Well, instead of doing all those formulas, uh, you can see right away you got 50% open frontage. You can go right to table six, and you're in the one story, 50% open frontage. Boom, you got you know you got 40,000 square feet per story. It's a single story building, so we're just talking about 40,370. Very easy. Is it a little bit ballpark? Yes, but uh, I think a great thing for easy reference. You can work out the details later with the actual equations if you need to. We also, of course, have these for every use group in the back of code conforming with design. This one is I1. Note that we also have them for non-sprinklered or 13R sprinkler buildings. We also, these are some of the footnotes. Uh, I think they're helpful to the I1 table. For instance, uh, you don't get an area increase for 13R, we tell you that. The table values reflect that, of course. So if we did a quick example here for a, just the same as we did before, you can go through this on your own, but you got I1, 13R, go to this table in the back, table 10. Uh, what is this, a single story building or two story, I forget. But anyway, for one, two, and three, you've got 56, 20 per floor, very quick. I bring up the, ta the table for group M here just to show you one additional feature. We've even built into these table when you can be unlimited area in accordance with the unlimited area building provision uh, in section, um, in chapter five under the unlimited area building section. 507, I believe that is. So even in this table, and this means if you've got 60 feet of open perimeter, the footnote explains this, You've got unlimited area. Try to be very practical and useful with these tables um, as we go. Good reference for your desk. As I mentioned, there are categories in the IBC for unlimited area buildings. You've got um, single story, B, F, M, and S can be unlimited area. Two, only two criteria. These are wood frame construction types also, even type 5. 
NFPA 13 sprinkler system and 60 feet all around for these use groups. Even You can even have A1 and A2 connected to one of these. This is limited to type 3 and 4 construction. But you can have these more or less heavy-duty assembly occupancies in an unlimited area building under these conditions. A3s have their own limits, type 3 or 4 construction. And A4s even have a category for unlimited area. Even Group E has a category and conditions under which you can be unlimited in area. Three or four construction, two means, each classroom having two means of egress, one directly to the exterior of the building, and then surrounded on all sides by 60 feet. Non-sprinklered unlimited area, you can have them, F2, S2, see the conditions. Two-story unlimited area, BFMRS, surprising to some people, but for these use groups, same conditions, 13 systems, 60 feet all around, you can go two stories. There's a provision for reduced open space if you have, if you meet all the other conditions for unlimited area, but you got a couple walls or one wall that's a little too close to the property line, then section 50721 lets you rate that for three hours, protect the openings and so forth, and still unlimited in area. You can use firewalls, of course, to um, define your building so that you can put up a firewall and keep going with your building in terms of allowable size. Very important, firewalls, of course, are not fire barriers, are not fire partitions. These are their own animals, so to speak. They have their own purposes and conditions, their own sections of the code. So it's only firewalls in 706. It's not a fire barrier, not a fire partition, not smoke barrier. Firewalls are the ones that define the building limits. They have their own set of requirements in terms of materials and also how they're put together structurally. Materials, only type 5 can be a wood frame. Type 3 and 4 must be non-combustible firewalls. Um, so. But that's the last way to increase the size of your actual structure is to actually split it up with firewalls. I'm going to stop right here. We're at about 10 till 3. I'm going to ask Michelle Camby Roan, who's our Director of Education, who's been watching the questions come in. Uh, we're pretty much done with the building size topic. And I wonder who I've confused with an errant comment or whatever. So I'm interested in a good question or two on uh, building size. Michelle? OK, great. Um, are you able to hear me now? Yes. OK. At least I am. <laughs> <laughs> we have one question come in that was asking about um, seasonal housing for seasonal um, Know, when people come in seasonally and they stay at one place and then they leave, what category of occupancy would that be under? And one caveat is it's government housing. So okay. they were trying to figure out what occupancy. Well, I know all the code officials in the audience are chomping at the bit to answer this one. <laughs> um, here's the way I would approach it. Uh, I would say whatever the most restrictive use of that could be at any time of the year, that's what you have to call that occupancy. Mm -hmm. The code does not, will not give you a break on uh, the time, time spent in that occupancy or just its limited use in the same way that a code, the code does not allow you to have less than full group A assembly um, conditions when you use one room for assembly only one day of the year, you still got to comply with the assembly provisions for that room. It'd be the okay. same with a seasonal seasonal occupancy. If you're there only three weeks of the year, um, whatever the code says for the maximum use, the most restrictive or most hazardous use would apply across the board. I can't mm -hmm. think. I can't really think of any um, exception that the code would give for that. If, if anyone else can think of one or knows one I don't know about, maybe they can send in a note 
and we can uh, post it on our comments later. And and that's not only for housing. If you have any type of building and you're not sure of the occupancy because it doesn't fit right into a category, mm -hmm. the code does state the to go with the most restrictive. Is that right? Or well, the tip is to speak to the building official or whoever has jurisdiction if you're on exactly. Two. Yeah, in regard to use group, you choose the one that most nearly resembles. But right. you're right, if there's an activity that re that is more restrictive or hazardous, you have to go with that one. The code right. official will definitely uh, help you um, go the right direction on that. Yeah. Okay. All right, T can you take one more question or should we sure. move along? No, let's, okay. let's have another. One more question is about, um, it was mentioned when going through about the height and area tables and that all residential occupancies require sprinklers. Is that, mm -hmm. and in the previous table, in table um, 503 in 2012 IBC, it doesn't specifically state that in that table, correct? Uh, that all yeah. residential? So where does that c come from, that all residential require sprinklers? It comes from Chapter 9. If you go to the Group R, remember I said, yeah, i got to check Chapter 9. Mm -hmm. And it def definitely works this way in, the, um, in both codes, I believe, 2012, 2015. You have to choose the sprinklered columns for Group R. Now, you might have an existing building that's not sprinklered. You may be using some of the values for unsprinklered. That would be the only case I would think that you could right. use those values in Chapter 5 for unsprinklered. But that's a Chapter 9 hard threshold. You go to the section yep. in Chapter 9 for Group R, and it just says all Group Rs have to be sprinklered. Now, right. there may be some residential occupancies in Group I and Group R, there are specific conditions, group homes, and, and so forth. Again, if there are, they pretty much have to be sprinklered. But there may be a few isolated exceptions uh, for the type of sprinkler, like you might be able to have a 13R sprinkler or whatever. But, but it's a Chapter 9 threshold. And yeah, it doesn't. He's right. The commenter is, doesn't say it in Chapter Five. You're right. But that's, yeah, that's and there, back to that table in um, IBC 2015. There is a footnote in Table 504.3 that the non-sprinkler row only applies to existing buildings. Oh, so, that's great. Great to point yeah. that out. Thank you. Footnote D. Okay, oh, that was great. So I think we'll go back to doing the webinar. Is that okay? Sounds good. Okay, great, thanks. All right, I think you're seeing a slide that says stack buildings. We talked about building size. There's some special occupancies uh, that quote unquote violate this building size uh, criteria that we've been talking about so far. And the way it does it is it sets up specific conditions under which you can have an extra story or parking underneath a building or whatever as long as you meet these specific conditions. It's all in Section 510 in the 2015 code. And the whole I, the primary focus of the development of these provisions was to allow a parking structure underneath a residential building, for instance. These are referred to as pedestal buildings because um, it looks like the building on top is on a pedestal. It's typically concrete parking structure. The most uh, common section in this 510 is 510.2. This one is probably the most versatile and most used section for the special occupancies. But it is important to note that each of these subsections in section 510 stand on their own. So you don't have to comply with all the conditions of 510.2 unless you're using 510.2. There's other options for a special occupancy building. This is the one used most often, though. You've got a type 1A uh, lower building. You are allowed uh, various occupancies here. Um, hold on. I'm sorry to do this to you. I wanted to see what was ahead there. But the conditions, uh, you have a three-hour separation between the building below and the building above. Uh, you have height limits, I'll discuss those in a minute. You have some use group 
restrictions, but they're very limited. They're usually, most common use groups are permitted in both the upper and lower building now. And when you do this, you can have, uh, you can consider the upper building uh, independent of the lower building. So, for instance, here's your pedestal. Say we're using 510.2. Well, first of all, this right here has to be three hours. And then if you look at 510.2, this building down here has to be type 1A. Uh, highly, or non-combustible, highly rated. Maybe concrete parking structures, typical. Then you got the three hours, and then you've got a separate building up above. Now I say separate building, what do I mean? All I mean is you can start counting your stories from above this separation. That's the way it works. Start counting your stories from above the separation. Very important. You don't get any extra height. If you have a type 5, extra height in feet, rather. If you have a type 5 building up here, you measure from the top of it to grade. You cannot go beyond the height in feet limitation for type 5 for the upper building. That's always been the condition of using 510.2. So what advantage does it get you? Only that you can start counting your stories over again on the top of this separation. Start counting your stories so you might be able to fit an extra story or two in here. Um, but you don't get to go any higher with a type 5 on top or a type 3 on top. Now also very important, I wish I had a slide. Um, I'll insert one for the next um, webinar. But in the 2015 code, one particular thing happened here, and that is the code was changed to allow this lower building to be more than one story. In the 2012, it's one story. Now it can be more than one story. Or I take that back. I think that changed in the 2012. It can be more than one story already in the 2012. So that means you could have two or three stories of type 1A pedestal construction under 510.2 and have one or two stories of type 5 or 3A on the top. And of course, there's no additional risk in that regard. You're basically, since you can't go any higher than specific feet above grade for the lower construction type on the top, you're basically substituting your uh, certain floors of what might be wood frame construction with type 1A. And so it's versatile. It does allow you, however, the flexibility to top off your um, non-combustible, perhaps, construction type buildings with um, wood frame construction. All right, I'll go on here. I said that each of these sections is independent of the other. Here's another alternative here, R1, R2 buildings, uh, 3A construction only. If you go to that section, it tells you you've got to have firewalls every 3,000 square feet on every story or to bisect the building. That's the conditions for that one. Here's another alternative, 510.4, group S2. You can take a look at that. Um, there's a section 510.7 for open parking beneath these use groups, specific conditions again, possibly some extra means of egress provisions. They all have their own conditions and they all um, work on their own. So look at those subsections in 510 for your special occupancies. Big topic we're going to go into now, fire resistance. Let me uh, start with this table, uh, 601. You're familiar with this table. It's the table that gives you the fire resistance ratings uh, required for various construction types. So got your building elements here, your ratings over here, you're familiar with this. Type 4, I'll point out just a couple things here that are rather distinctive about this table that um, are something to think about when we're dealing with this table only. That is that, first of all, you've got various reasons for fire resistance in the code. The reason for fire resistance in this table is the building structure itself, to give it some longevity in a fire or fire resistance in a fire. Um, you've got other reasons for fire resistance. Uh, you've got separations and so forth. This table doesn't deal with that. This is only for the structure, the overall performance of the structure in the event of a fire. I'll point out footnote C here would allow you to have, you see C, 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 C across here. 
that allows you to have heavy timber in those elements. Even up through types 1 and 2, doesn't allow you that in type 1A. It does not allow you that in 1A. But So you can have a heavy timber roof. I'll point out that heavy timber doesn't mean rated. There is a rating required for the exterior walls. But heavy timber has an assumed fire resistance based on the dimension of the heavy timber element. And those minimum dimensions were, are given in 602.4 of the IBC. So I think I'll move on. There are actually uh, seven ways, if you count them all, to establish fire resistance. And these are the ways. They're listed here. I'm going to go through these individually with some slides. The most familiar, of course, is the testing alternative. We're all familiar with E119 or UL263 um, test standard. You can establish fire resistance that way. You choose an assembly or a building element out of a directory. I think most of us are familiar with that. 703.3 also allows you to use designs that are documented in approved sources. This is one that we offer, DCA3. DCA stands for Design for Code Acceptance. You'll see these on our website. You can download them, print them out. These are building assemblies of wood that are assigned. It's like a, a fire resistance directory, in a sense. Um, we've used the data from many tests to prescribe assemblies. What is calculated fire resistance? Well, if you have exposed heavy timber, for instance, you can calculate a fire resistance of that. And there's a methodology for doing that. You can have an exposed beam or column with a one hour or two hour fire resistance rating. We say, well, how can that be? Well, you're in effect, you're designing that to burn. If it uh, if, as it burns, it's going to be sized such that it will retain the structural capacity to hold its loads for a certain period of time. And you can see from this diagram, there is an assumed charring layer and the core that's unaffected for a period of time by the fire will hold the desired load for a specific period. The methodology for calculating this and sizing the member correctly is in Chapter 16 of the NDS, and that's directly, you're directed there by the IBC in Section 722, I believe it is. And then we have another publication, very useful, technical report number 10, recently updated to include provisions for calculating fire resistance of cross-laminated timber. That shows designs exa examples and calculation examples. One of the other alternatives for establishing fire resistance is um, the component additive method. This is in 722.6 of the code. Uh, most of us, are, at least code officials, are familiar with this. I'm sure engineers are too. You, this is the basis on which, for instance, you can say, that a wall with 16 inch on center studs and type, five eight, type X 5 8 inch gypsum can be assumed to be a one hour wall because the common elements of many tested systems have been analyzed and we've determined a method for, in a sense, building up a fire resistance rated assembly. This is a table right out of the code book showing, for instance, that the membrane of the, of the um, light frame wall gives you so many minutes. This method is another way to assign fire resistance to a prescriptive assembly. You've got a table, or rather, I'll talk about this first. 703.3 does allow an engineering analysis based on a comparison of tested assemblies. It's typically done, perhaps, by someone who uh, has training in fire protection engineering. But you can accept other alternatives if you have confidence in them in terms of substantiation. And uh, that brings us to another question.
So um, please take a look at this question. And Marcy, if you want to poll us, we'll get people engaged again. Alrighty, here we go. Which of the following is not a method of establishing fire resistance? A, prescriptive assemblies found in the building code. B, calculations in accordance with section 722 or the NDS. C, engineering analysis based on comparing tested assemblies. Or D, non-destructive field testing per ASTM E84. All right, 30% of you have voted. Keep going. Going to give you probably about 15 more seconds. And then I'm going to go ahead and close. And Paul, I'm going to share with you since you can't really see this. So we've got about 69% that said non-destructive field testing per ASTM E84. 18% said engineering analysis based on comparing tested assemblies. 10% said calculations in accordance with Section 722 or the NDS. And only 3% said prescriptive assemblies found in the building code. All right, and then I'm going to give it back to you so you can give us the real answer. Very good. Well, most of you got it right. Very good. This is the one that's not uh, permitted. There's really no, uh, this brought some chuckles, I imagine, but there's no real field testing that I'm aware of, certainly not by E84, which is a flame spread. But the rest of these are, are permitted. We, you can do calculations. You can do an engineering analysis. So, well done on that one. Types 1 and 2 construction, there's a list in the code where you can use uh, wood. 603 has a list, 26 applications in uh, 2015 where you can use wood in a type 1 or 2 building. Some typical applications across, so there's a broad application for fire retardant treated wood. Um, it certainly in all non-bearing exterior walls, you can use that on types one and two. Um, roof construction, I mentioned footnote C in table 601. It can be used, of course, in the exterior walls of type three and four. Heavy timber, it's another application, uh, one hour or uh, for, hev for um, heavy timber. And I, why is this in this section on non-combustible? Well, because it's in 603. Uh, it just reiterates it. Other type 1 and 2 applications, these are you know, interior finishes, millwork, trim, flooring, windows, doors, and so forth. Uh, exterior wall coverings, balconies, projections, and so forth. Um, so go to that list in 603. That's the place to find it. This is a catch-all section. We do have such a thing as a wood foundation has its own standards or its own uh, protection requirements and its own standard. Feel free to peruse that on our website. Types one and two, we've talked about that. Wood walls and partitions, three and four, typical applications. Four, you do have, I put this in because you have an exception. Not everything has to be heavy timber and you can have uh, one hour partitions or a specific solid wood uh, prescribed uh, partition of matched boards. And of course, probably the most common in types one and two building interior finish can be wood. Uh, chapter eight is the governing uh, chapter for that. This is out of the code conforming wood design. I'll caution you that this is not an exact table out of the code book. So we tried to actually make it as a kind of easy reference compared to the code book table. There are footnotes to this table. Pay attention to those. Uh, this, the flame spread classification across the top here is based on testing in accordance with E84, ASTM E84, UL723 location. Uh, these are the use groups that need these required classifications. This is for non-sprinklered, and then we have the table also for sprinklered. Right. 
Interior finish. We also have a design for code acceptance number one, flame spread of wood products. Say, for instance, the manufacturer can't provide you for whatever reason or the information is lost or whatever. Flame spread for a particular species of wood exposed in the building as an interior finish. DCA 1 lists those according to species. This has been recently updated. Uh, some things have changed a little bit based on improved criteria for testing. So take a look, uh, download it again, keep it in your drawer if you'd like. There are some standard exceptions for interior finish. Right off the bat, wood floors uh, get a pass. Traditional wood floors get a pass on flame spread requirements. Um, also, Structural members in Type 4 building, heavy timber members, no specific restriction on those. The assumption being that uh, they're large members spaced appropriately, um, contents in a fire, contents is going to easily take over, um, be much be the, the greater part of the risk, not the finish of the structural heavy timber members themselves. By the way, when we're talking cross-laminated timber now, of course we have an increase in wood that may be exposed or may be also the interior finish. So we're trying to address those criteria in the code very carefully. For trim, Class C is the minimum uh, required. You've got wood trim is an 806.7 is limited to 10% of the wall or ceiling area. Can exterior doors and windows be wood? They certainly can. They do have to be, the, the real criteria for exterior openings is the fire resistance rating based on its separation from property line or from another building in the same lot unless they're considered one building for those purposes, but they can certainly be wood. The real question is, are they required to be fire resistant, fire protection rated? <clears throat> you know, what governs the protections of openings and exterior walls? You can go in table seven and 5.8 has that. There's some rules of thumb you get used to, I think with this. Exterior walls are 30 feet or more from the lot line. It's pretty much unlimited amounts of openings and unprotected. Um, if the building's sprinklered, 20 feet. 10 feet if it's type 2B or 5B construction. You might say, well, why is that? And that's because those buildings ha are uh, sized appropriately for their own inherent fire resistance or features and they're smaller structures in general. Uh, no unprotected openings uh, in exterior walls within five feet, and three feet, no openings at all. There is a section for bay and oriel window windows, and you can use fire retardant treated wood for those, but otherwise, same as for the building construction type. What about doors on the interior? Can they be wood? Certainly can, but again, are they required to have a rating? Maybe. Depends on the wall they're located in. If, you, if that wall is a uh, fire resistance rated separation of some type, then the, fire, the material of the door will depend on the listing, the fire protection rating. If the wall is only rated due to construction type, then you can certainly have wood door and your opening is not required to be protected if it's not specifically required for some type of separation. So it's not always the case that if you have a rated wall that you have to have a rated fire protection opening. If the wall is only rated due to construction type and no other reason, then that requirement for protection does not translate to the openings. Corridors are their own animal in that regard. And you do, there is a corridor section, and you can check the ratings required for that. 
wood siding. It's regulated in 1406. If you need to know where to go, there's minimum thicknesses and so forth. Chapter 23, we'll see, uh, we're coming up on it here, is the location to go for the structural building provisions. What about balconies? All right, there's, there's a rather, there's a section here, 1406.3. It takes a little while to untangle that section. I think this slide has some good basic base principles for us. First of all, um, it does, let me get my, uh, my little thing back here. It does uh, have to be of type four construction if it's on a non-combustible building. And in general, for most construction types, your balcony has to be type four construction, that is heavy timber. And you know what's required to be heavy timber? Well, the structural elements, in this case, the floor. Uh, the balusters and so forth can be according to their stru the uh, structural requirements based on the loading. But the floor element itself would have to be heavy timber. Now, the alternative is you provide the same fire resistance rating equal to the floor in the building that it's attached to. So that's a general rule for wood balconies and commercial buildings, even in types one and two, is you have limits, certainly, to the area of the balcony. You have some exceptions for sprinklers. There can be a little bit less than this provided if the this is sprinklers for the balcony itself. But as a general rule, heavy timber or same rating is required for the floor that it's connected to. Can you have wood stairs? Yes. If you go to 1011.7 and 1012.7 in types four and five construction, you can have wood stairs, exterior. You typically would have to be protected um, from the weather, uh, but buildings up to six stories and no high rise. Wood roof coverings have a system of classification based on these test standards. And class B roofing for the most part on types 2B, 3B, and 5B. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Class uh, uh, minimum class C and class B uh, for all types except those construction types that I mentioned. What about projections? You know, projections from the exterior wall. As a general rule, when you get too close to the property line, you've got some protections required. Now, right here, either one hour type four heavy timber or fire retardant treated wood. We worked pretty hard on this diagram in code conforming wood design document. For those that are um, looking at their document or flipping through, you're going to find this on page uh, 24. I'll just point out a couple things. There's various criteria, so this is a difficult diagram. but. One thing here is your projection does not have to be uh, protected in any way. It doesn't have to be one hour, fire turn tree, or wood or whatever, unless it extends within five feet of the line used for fire separation distance. So that's a big one. Um, so then you have um, various other criteria and limits here. First of all, no projections are permitted within two feet. Um, between two and three feet, you've got these projections or these protections required for your projection. Um, you've got a limit to the projection based on the distance from the property line. It gives you a little bit of leeway as you move the building out. Um, and then um, well, take a look at this and unpack it a little bit more. Um, I think it'll be helpful to you. Can you have wood on top of a building? Yes, penthouses can be fire retardant treated wood. There's specific provisions, 15.10. Type one construction, two stories or less. You can even have fire retardant treated wood, uh, mechanical penthouses and so forth. Um, 
if you uh, have type two construction, you have to be at least five feet from the lot line. You know, the lot line extend, you know, still extends upward even though you're on top of the building. Um, so look at 510, 15 point, or I'm section, section 15.10 rather on that. Rooftop structures also has their own section. Three, four, and five A construction permits penthouses to be type four, fire retardant tree to wood, specific conditions there. You can have wood towers, spires, domes, cupolas. Uh, they have their own limitations, area limitations. Five ten point five or fifteen ten point five. A reminder that any wood that's exposed to the weather has to be pressure preservative treated or naturally resistant to decay. Look at 2304.12 for all the locations where this is the case. All right, one more poll question. I think this is the last one. I think you're uh, right. Yep. Go right, for it, Marcy. Right. All right, interior finishes are classified as Class A, Class B, or Class C in accordance with flame spread characteristics. Is this true or false? Wow, lots of people already on top of it. Excellent. And a heavy percentage toward one answer. None of this 50-50% on this answer. Hmm. All right. Not many people voting. Let's vote, folks. <laughs> I've got 70%. Let's go to 75%. Um, even if you don't know, just vote. Take a chance. Um, I'm going to close the poll at 50 seconds. All right, let's go. And sharing. I've got 87% say true, 13% say false, and Paul, the real answer is? Very good. It's true. That's the system. Class A, B, or C, flame spread in that table 803 that we showed. So very good. All right, we added a section to the code conforming wood design for structural considerations. Um, and this primarily deals with the structure of Chapter 23. Chapter 23, entitled Wood, has these divisions in it, minimum standards and quality, design consideration and standards, general construction requirements, conventional light frame construction. There are five design paths that you can take in accordance with the International Building Code. Liable stress design, that's, most, that's the most familiar one for engineers designing in wood. We do have, though, load and resistance factor design, LRFD. The NDS is a dual format uh, book now containing the provisions for LRFD as well as ASD. Then you have in the IBC in Chapter 23, you have conventional light frame construction. We have to be very careful about uh, our approach to this section of Chapter 23. It fulfills a specific purpose, and the specific purpose is for a specific set of buildings. So we'll talk about that. Then we have the AWC wood frame construction manual. We'll talk about that. That's an alternative listed in Chapter 23. Um, now, it's primarily, that manual is primarily for single and two-family dwellings, but there are some applications for commercial buildings, and we'll note those parameters for you. And then we have a standard in Chapter 23 for log structures. It's an ICC standard number 400. So if we were to take a walk through uh, Chapter 23, you'd find uh, in Section 2303, minimum production and quality control criteria listed in this order, structural sawn lumber, end joint lumber, prefabricated eye joists, glue lambs, and so forth. You see structural cross-laminated, uh, glued cross-laminated timber, be a new section, 2015. 
pressure preservative treated wood. These are all going to find in section 2303 listed there. And of course, we go there primarily to make sure that the materials we're using are in accordance with their required standards. And then if you move to 2304, you've got a lot of prescriptive framing details. These apply across the board. For the most part, there are minimums across the board. You won't necessarily be using these necessarily if you're designing a wood frame structure. You may find them to be inadequate for your particular design. Um, but they are, the important thing is these are features that are there as minimums and lacking another need uh, based on your design, uh, you do have to meet these. So 2304 applies to all design methods. We do have a section in 2304.6, I'll point this out for structural panels and sheathing. This is the minimum required manufacturing criteria in terms of um, the glue used in wood structural panels for exterior application is listed in this section. Um, wood structural panels, of course, are plywood or, or oriented strand board or another composite panel. You have a table for minimum spans and connections if you're doing wind design. So 2304.6 um, will be your minimum span insulation and span for wood structural panels if you're doing wind design. So it's almost always in play. I'll happen to mention that in 2304.9 there's a section entitled lumber decking. This has gotten some attention lately as a nail laminated timber design. It's wood members set on edge, uh, nailed together. It's making a little bit of a resurgence in terms of use in building design. And if you go to 2304.9, you'll see the conditions that are listed here uh, for this kind of design. You've got a whole section on connectors and fasteners. These are common for, um, it's common rather for your connections, your design connections uh, to be, to exceed what's given here. Similar to this entire section, these are minimums that are assumed for light frame design, especially the fastening table. And you cannot go below these minimums unless, uh, uh, you can never go underneath these minimums, but your design may call for something in addition to this. Um, and that's the, that's the thing that needs to be determined, of course. You have a general requirement for a continuous load path uh, from roof to foundation. You have specific provisions allowing you to use uh, manufactured anchors and so forth in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. And you have specific provisions for fasteners to be fire uh, corrosion resistance if they're in preservative treated or fire retardant treated wood. What about uh, lateral force resisting systems? They have their own section in the IBC Chapter 23. And for the most part now in Chapter 23, they refer to this standard, Special Design Provisions for Wind and Seismic. It's in this standard that you'll find your um, shear wall capacity tables, diaphragm capacities, and so forth. You will find some things left in the 2015 IBC uh, in regard to capacities for certain elements that are staple connected. These have not been transferred to the special design provisions for wind and seismic. When you design in accordance with uh, these standards, the NDS and the special design provisions for wind and seismic, you're, you're designing, you're complying with the code. So, these are, your, these are your criteria. The code directly references these. You're in compliance with Chapter 23 if you're designing in accordance with these. Now we have a whole set of provisions in 2308 
that come into play. These are a holdover from when the building code did not distinguish so much between uh, dwellings and commercial buildings. So this is a set of prescriptive requirements in 2308 that generally would apply to dwellings. However, they are applicable and can certainly be used for light frame construction that fits within their scope. Um, right away in 2308.2, if you go to the IBC and you look at that, you'll see a list of limits, height limits, range from one story in the high seismic categories to three stories in the low seismic categories. You've got a floor-to-floor -floor height limit. You've got exterior bearing walls and interior walls um, limited to 10 feet. And finally, you've got, uh, this is probably the most limiting uh, criteria for using 2308. Your floor loads, your live floor loads can't exceed 40 pounds per square foot. So you can see this is all set up for residential construction. It has limited application for commercial buildings because of these floor loads. And you do have to be careful uh, about that. But it contains your repetitive member span tables for girders, floor joists, ceiling joists, and rafters when the floor loads that you're seeking are right. And these tables, by the way, do reflect the new Southern Pine design values. There was a revision recently in the Southern Pine design values. We have plenty of information on that posted on our website. Uh, if you just uh, go to our website and in the search box you print Southern Pine design values, you'll see addendums to previous uh, standards and also addendums to the I codes themselves, the International Building Code, the International Residential Code, if you're still using, for instance, the 2009 IRC or 2009 IVC, you actually can go in there and if you want to use those codes and you want to find the correct spans for Southern Pine uh, members, we have the way that you need to mark up your code book. We have that all printed out and prepared for you and those links. So take a look. 2308 is where you'll find a lot of prescriptive framing details and limits, uh, lots of subsections describing various um, things such as limits on holes and notches and that kind of thing. Uh, very good guidelines, certainly required if you're building a building in conformance to 2308 and in the case of many of them um, completely uh, consistent with what would be a good engineered design under ASD or LRFD. And for the most part, these various framing detail sections would be consistent um, with the NDS. There is, again, for the buildings that fit within 2308, you've got some prescriptive uplift requirements. Uh, in 23, there's a table 2308.75. When you use that table, you do have to have a tie on every truss or rafter. Uh, below, the capacities are given. The needed capacities are given there. So check that if you're within the 2308 provisions. And you have uh, in 2308, again, for buildings that are within its scope, you've got the stud size and spacing tables. You've got some limits on stud height in order for 2308 to be applicable. <clears throat> Studs in non-load-bearing partitions are also mentioned and common framing details. Prescriptive wall bracing. This has evolved. You now have, you enter into a couple different tables. Well, in the IBC, it's still based on seismic design category and story height. The real change in wall bracing, of course, has been in the IRC. That's out of the scope of this um, document, CCWD. But the IBC has stayed pretty much the same. Um, the prescriptive bracing methods permitted are listed in 2308.63 parentheses 1. 
Let's talk about the wood frame construction manual a minute. It's directly referenced as its own section now in 2309. This is new in the 2015 risk category one and two buildings only, by the way. And there's a table in the front of this wood frame construction manual which gives you minimum building dimensions. If you fit within the scope of those height limits and aspect ratio for the building and so forth, then you can use the wood frame construction manual as a design tool uh, for your commercial building. As you might guess, um, most commercial buildings, when they have an upper story, they get kicked out because somewhere in that commercial building it exceeds 40 pounds per square foot. But certainly a slab on grade commercial structure, we thought um, the wood frame construction manual, since it is an engineered design and it is prescriptive and it is useful to designers and engineers in terms of pre-calculated tables and so forth, uh, we decided to uh, broaden its application, or at least uh, we sought through the code change in the last cycle to broaden its application to small commercial buildings within its scope. And I think that's going to work just fine. I hope people find it increasingly useful. Finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about precautions during construction. The codes do deal with this. It's unfortunately sometimes neglected. There have been some notable fires in the media at the time of construction uh, with catastrophic property loss. And this does need to be addressed. ICC is working on it. We're working on it. Um, problem is, if people don't want to enforce or follow the code, it's kind of hard to it's hard to control people's behavior in this regard, but here are what the code currently requires. Uh, fire extinguishers, stairways, and, or stairwells, and so forth. Um, lit means of egress as the building goes up. It's in section 3310. Standpipes, when you reach a certain height, functioning standpipes. Of course, sprinklers need to be commissioned before the building is occupied. And here's a requirement that was new in the 2012, and that is the IBC directly references in Chapter 33 all the requirements for precautions during construction in the IFC. Now, what this means is even if your jurisdiction or you're in a jurisdiction or designing in a jurisdiction that doesn't adopt the IFC, You've got a secondary reference to the IFC from the IBC for specific requirements for protection during construction. And the IFC is a little more comprehensive on this point. Deals with temporary heating equipment, smoking, a fire watch. Uh, fire watch must be maintained with qualified personnel if required by the fire code officials. So you got some flexibility here. And designers and engineers um, need to uh, work with the fire code official to make sure this happens if it's needed. In many cases, it is needed. Welding operations are governed and um, are mentioned in 3304. The owner of the project is supposed to designate a fire prevention superintendent responsible for fire prevention prevention during construction. Are, is this being done? We don't really know. We suspect not. Uh, perhaps it is for the better uh, designers and builders and owners. Accessible emergency phone, firefighting vehicle access within 100 feet of temporary or permanent fire department connections, water supply, safeguards during roofing, Okay, I'm going to mention a few resources here. These are our standards that are referenced directly in the building code. The NDS, of course, we've talked about uh, special design provisions for wind and seismic, wood frame construction manual, and so forth. Uh, we hope this becomes, code conforming wood designs becomes a 
useful resource to you. What we've just summarized and uh, of course the presentation itself can only touch on each topic lightly, but if you have this, you have an index, so to speak, to the building code itself. So um, download this, uh, email me for a glossy copy of it. We'll have some of those available in the future. Um, keep it on your shelf. It's your index to requirements in the IBC. We have these that we've mentioned. These are all downloadable, printable right off our website, awc.org. And of course, there's many standards referenced in the building code, and we just list them in the CCWD so you have a sense of what they are. Many ICC codes and other standards. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Now I'd like to, we have some time left over, and this might be um, one of the best parts of the course, and that is getting a few questions and um, the more questions, the better, because that's how we learn um, some of the more interesting things. So, And I'm so. going to interject here. Sorry, I don't mean to be rude, oh. but I just want to yeah. encourage everybody to please stay on, because if you want your certificate, you need to stay until 4. <laughs> so um, make sure that you stay the entire time to um, get be um, here for 90% of the time um, to get your certificate. So. Thank you. That that's Great. for Eastern time. <laughs> oh yes, You're thank you. California. <laughs> I forget all about that. But I yes, know. make sure that you stay for the entire time of the webinar. So, <laughs> thank you, Marcia. Thank you. That's a great reminder. Thanks. Okay, Paul. Let's see. Are you ready? We have some really good questions. Great. This is more a clarification, I think, from one of our viewers, and it has to do with that previous question related to workers that are seasonal. There is a definition in Chapter 2 um, for transient in Chapter 2. And then also occupancy R-1 talks about transient um, residential Occupancies, so that may be a tip on where they can look for that type yeah. of seasonal housing. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. So there's apparently some, <coughs> excuse me, specific requirements, maybe, regarding transient housing that I mm -hmm. haven't, haven't really touched on. So appreciate the tip that it's in the definitions and in in the group R description. Yeah, yeah that's great. I mean, there's limitations on time limits and all that, but um, good tip. But as we said, also speak with your building official if you're not sure. So there was a question or um, someone thought that it might be helpful to tell the difference between the IRC and the IBC because we were talking about residential. Okay, very good. Yes, um, the IRC is scoped to single and two-family dwellings and townhouses. If you read the scoping provisions of the IRC, and it's meant to work with the IBC. The system between the IBC and the IRC is such that um, if something fits in the scope of the IRC, it's written out of the scope of the IBC. So now, many of you in the West Coast perhaps are objecting or would disagree with this. There's a couple different ways to look at this. There are some jurisdictions that still use the IBC for single and two-family dwellings. However, they do have to modify the scope sections of those. So, if they're if they're doing that, so the way it's set up is single-family dwellings, two-family dwellings, and townhouses, which are defined as not more than three stories, um, open sides. On it. there's a definition for townhouse. They have to go from foundation to roof. In other words, it can't be stacked apartment style. Um, they do have to have open, be open on at least two sides, I believe. Uh, maybe I'm going beyond. We can look at the definition of townhouse, but anyway. So townhouses, you can have a row of attached units with a fire resistance rated wall. Uh, the, the, the common wall would be two hours, except in a sprinkler 
townhouse, I believe, you get to go down to one. Um, but take a look at the provisions for Chapter 3 in the IRC for townhouses, the definition of townhouse in the IRC. Those are all under the IRC. But everything else uh, is in the IBC. And you can have residential use group, of course, apartment buildings and all that in the IBC, but condominiums and so forth that don't fit the definition of townhouse, they are regulated by the IBC. And it, the way they're set up, uh, the model codes are set up, there's, if there's something in the scope of the IRC, it's not within the scope of the IBC. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying that. Here, here's another question. In type four construction, heavy timber construction, are concealed spaces permitted in the space if it's sprinklered, in the building, if it's sprinklered? Currently, no. There's no exception that I'm aware of in the current code for concealed spaces in a type four building. Just by definition, you don't have concealed space, for instance, above the ceiling in a type four building. Everything has to be visible. And the reason is, in order for a, a Type 4 building to be the size that's permitted, it's assumed as a certain fire resistance. And it's also assumed that you can see these members um, that are exposed wood. Now, does it make sense to allow uh, concealed space to be sprinklered as an me alternative means of protection of Type 4? Absolutely, it does. And there are many code officials who have... Um, approved alternate methods and materials for protection of certain concealed spaces. When might this come into play? Usually not in a new building, but in a lot of communities where they're trying to reuse heavy timber structures in the downtown area or whatever, they could certainly come up with criteria for protecting those concealed spaces that would be considered uh, to not introduce any additional risk into the building. Now we've introduced a code change this cycle uh, G181 that offers an alternative to having concealed spaces in Type 4 that are protected. And the means of protection we've chosen, and you can go on to NFPA 13, the standard itself currently, and see what they require for combustible concealed spaces and perhaps use that as a criteria. We use that in the code change and it was looked upon favorably um, by the at the public comment hearing. So for those of you who are voting, that's a, you look at that and you can see if you like it or not. Um, so perhaps at the next edition of the code, there will be uh, combustible concealed spaces permitted in Type 4. And the criteria, one of the alternatives to that is sprinkling it. So um, if that's deemed appropriate, we'll see that in the next edition of the code. I would say that's certainly an appropriate alternative for protecting a concealed space. But it's not not permitted outright in the code yet. Great. That's excellent feedback. Okay, so uh, we have another question and perhaps I, I know you went over podiums and um, there was a slide addressing this, but maybe you could reiterate the change from the 2012 that limits concrete podiums above grade to one level and what happened in the 2015. Mm -hmm. Well, just simply it took out the clause that said the lower building cannot, can be no more than one story. Um, when you really think about it, you wonder why that limit was ever in there. Um, as long as the building still cannot exceed um, the allowable height from grade for the upper building, what's, what's the extra risk? Mm -hmm. and that's exactly what happened, is they just eliminated a clause in there that when the 510.2 set up the original provisions for the lower building and the upper building, one of the conditions on the lower building was it's one story above grade. And the, since they, they kept all the other provisions in place for limiting the height, and they said there's no reason why the type 1A lower building can't be more than one story. So a very simple, straightforward change. Great. Thank you. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit, and there was a slide regarding stairs uh, at the exterior of the building, I believe is what it was, and it says, uh, at the risers, are they required to be closed per Chapter 11 if it's an ex exit stair? Do you remember that slide? Oh, man. Yeah. 
Yeah, it showed open risers, didn't it? Yeah. Here's my guess. Since it's a, we were talking about exterior stairs there, yeah. my guess is that there's a limit on the amount of opening, the height of that opening, um, for fall prevention of kids and so forth. It might be four inches, I'm thinking. But I don't remember any specific prohibition for it having to be a closed riser stair. And if I'm uh, incorrect on that, then we've learned something, and I appreciate the person pointing that out. I'll change that. But I think it would just be a, a limitation on the opening for fall provision since it's an, since it's an exterior stair. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be four inches. Okay. And that's a question. We're going to follow up on some of these questions, too, and give the responses back to the attendees. We need to. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the little safety net there. Uh, yeah. Okay, and um, let's see if we have any other, we did have a question about if they have to be on at 4 o'clock on the Pacific time. No, you only have to stay up till 1. <laughs> um, I think that's it. I don't know if you wanted to make any more comments. Maybe on our website, you could go to, if you can show your desktop, and show where people can actually get a copy of the CCWD because I know there was some challenges. If you could show us our your desktop. Let's see. Okay. Let's go. Um, I don't know if this is going to work, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll try it out. Yeah. So he's yeah, going to we'll show us. This is great. We'll take a little tour through the website. All right. Um, First of all, if you're code, you code officials out there, if you're interested in the current code development cycle, there's a couple links right here for you, um, especially you voters and needing to make decisions in the governmental consensus process. Okay, now let's look over here. Quick links is what I like to use. Um, if you go to publications and um, to get this code conforming wood design right here, I just click on this. It should open up a PDF. It allows you to choose. This is the one we're talking about today. I'm going to open it up here. Is this what you wanted me to do, Michelle? Yes, or were you yes. I believe for the brought, um, some People are having some challenges with printing it, but I believe Brian has stepped in and um, changed it so it is printable now. Okay. What and I that's what. Did, yeah. Yeah. I printed it out myself just this morning, so I think it should be good to go. Um, yeah. I would I would save it over here somewhere on your computer and go in and print it out if you're having trouble. Maybe that would work better. But you can save it, definitely. Uh, we want people to print and use this. Um, we can, uh, you've, it's nicely tabbed over here, um, and so. Uh, and then um, we have a few more minutes, and we'll turn it over to Marcy to close it out. But one more thing. Do you want to show the actual uh, link to the code changes? What, did you mention that previously? Yeah, here you go. Um, right here, this link right here will take you to AWC's activity in the current code uh, change cycle. There is, if you wonder what this is about, <clears throat> D170, there was a technical error discovered late on. It was supposed to be a editorial change from the Building Code Action Committee. It turned out to be not simply editorial. In fact, real problems with it. So BCAC has issued a statement. The code officials can go there and take a look. Um, needs to be disapproved. Um, not, I'm not saying anything controversial there. The, um, the original change was simply supposed to be editorial re reformatting and, and actually it introduces a substantial technical change that does affect wood construction. So it can wait till next cycle we figure. figure. Um, You've got, we've got some videos on this link for fire testing of cross-laminated timber. 
and uh, you'll find some interesting. We did some recent testing at Southwest Research Laboratory. This is general interest for heavy timber and fire resistance related or um, mass timber uh, construction. You should find those very interesting. Um, here's a link uh, many of you would love to download the C CLT handbook. It is uh, downloadable for free in a PDF format. Uh, get that, put it on your computer. Um, let's go back to the home page again. Uh, codes and standards link. What do we got here? Calculators and software. Uh, we do have span calculators and so forth that you can access. Should be a good, great resource for you. We do have a whole um, resource center on fire and wood. One of our most popular downloads is the DCA6 deck manual here. Um, you can get to that uh, by going to decks. You hit this, you can get that. Um, let's see. I think. Uh, what is we got over here? You code officials can sign up for uh, frequent communications in regard to the code here. Our code official com connections publication and program education. This is a good one. Uh, take a look at the education section of our website. There's lots of things here that you can get CEUs for your ICC certification um, or professional development hours or whatever if you're a designer. Uh, by taking these courses on, uh, that we offer here, we are a preferred provider uh, for ICC. I think Marcy's already talked about that maybe and getting your, your hours. But you can download many of these and they're self-studies, a lot of them. You can get your hours, you have to take a quiz at the end. Uh, should be useful to you. Michelle, did you want to say anything more about this education section? Oh, here? yeah. Um, right now it's 20% for preferred provider credits, but on January 1st it's going to increase to 40% uh, needs to come from a preferred provider for ICC. ICC certification, so, right? Right. But we also, as you noticed, we have the AIA uh, accreditation AIA. and NCSEA as well. Most of our That's courses correct. are NCSEA accredited for you engineers. 